Now let's turn to the New Testament again, uh, this time to the letter to the Hebrews and chapter 9, and we'll read from verse 24. The whole chapter is a difficult chapter, and really it's the part at the end that we wish to focus on particularly. Verse 24, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, and that's a reference to the tabernacle here on earth which are copies of the true, because the tabernacle was a picture of heaven itself in many respects, but he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He would then have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. In other words, the priesthood of Christ is different because it has somehow accomplished the work. But now, he says, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin and for our salvation. So then, verse 27, As it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now, these verses highlight a connection between all of ourselves as people and the Lord Jesus Christ. A straightforward connection in a way. The first part of the connection is very simply that we all die. The opening part of verse 27 reminds us of that, that it is appointed for men to die once. And so it is true of Christ in verse 28, so Christ was offered once. Now that offering, of course, is a reference to his death. Uh, surely we can understand that. He offered himself on the cross and he gave himself as a sacrifice. And uh, the writer here doesn't simply say that he died once. It, he chooses the word offering because he wants to highlight something which we'll look at, God willing, tonight. But for now, the truth is very simple, that we all die once, and Christ dies once. That is something we have in common. The second part of the connection between ourselves and Christ is that for all of us, a great event follows that is called the judgment. For us, it is simply called the judgment here in verse 27. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. The judgment, that's the judgment of God. For Christ too, after he dies once, there is a great and solemn appearing. He appears, of course, in the heavens in his second coming. But that second coming is leading us to the judgment seat of Christ, where he himself sits. His appearing is leading there. And of course, he sits there, as we saw some time ago, to bless and to curse. Come to me, you blessed of my Father, and depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting life. So really, that's the connection. For us and for him, there's a death that we die once. And for us, and for him, there is an appearance at the judgment seat. We gathered there to be judged, and he appearing there as the judge of our lives, the judge of our souls. Now, the great idea that links these events is that they are all appointed by God. Every single death, which, every appearance at the judgment seat of Christ, is something that is appointed by God. Verse 27, 
the connections being made very plain and it's enforced. And as it is appointed for men to die, and after that the judgment, so Christ was offered, and he will appear a second time for salvation. All these things are appointed. Our death, Christ's death, your appearance at the judgment seat, and Christ's appearance at the judgment seat to dispense salvation, and indeed to dispense a curse. So our death as something appointed. Now, of course, we witness death in our midst in this past week, and it is a solemn thing. Sometimes, perhaps, people can become familiar with it. I don't know if you're familiar with it yourself. Uh, to a certain extent, a, a minister sees death very often. I remember often speaking to undertakers in different places about how often they see it and how, in a certain sense, you get used to it. But there's something about death that we must never get used to. We must never get used to it. The event itself is, of course, just a solemn separation between soul and body. That's what we're made of. According to the Scriptures, according to God's teaching, we are made of two parts. A part immaterial that we call the soul, and a part material that we call the body. And the separation of these two in death, that's what we call death. And it's something that has always struck fear into the hearts of people. I'm sure that you must at times be afraid of it yourself. The writer to the Hebrews in an earlier chapter speaks about the fear of death. And he speaks of us as being by nature in bondage to the fear of death. And it is a terrible thing. And it can bring a terrible bondage to be afraid of it. Sometimes it's been called the king of terrors and the terror of kings. King of terrors is obvious because there's nothing ultimately as frightening as it, really, when we fully understand it or comprehend it. And the terror of kings, because it doesn't matter how powerful you are, how rich or how wealthy, it strikes terror into your heart. It's really only a fool who never trembles at death. No, there's only one antidote to the fear of death, one real antidote to the fear of death, and that's because there's only one antidote to death itself. That is the Prince of Life. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who brought life and immortality to light. He himself is the life that we can find. And if we find life in him, we will overcome death. That's the significance of his powerful words to Martha when Martha was weeping at the graveside of her brother Lazarus, who I think and most people believe was significantly younger than herself. The Lord said to her, your brother will rise again. And she said, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus responds to that very powerfully by saying, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Do you believe this? Do you believe that everything involved in life, everything involved in a relationship with God, everything involved in a resurrection to life, do you believe that it's all bound up with me, he says? And yes, indeed it is. Find Christ and you find life. If you don't find Christ, you remain under the dominion of death, you remain under its terror, you remain in bondage to its fear. So there's only one antidote, but of course... <clears throat> If we don't want that antidote, if we don't want to pay the price of coming to Christ and so on, because that's what we sadly think of it, we have our own ways of coping with it. A common way nowadays is simply not to think about it, just to dismiss it from your minds. Um, or perhaps even to laugh at it, to make a joke about it. And there's an increasing trend, as you're all aware of, at funerals not to mourn. You're as well putting up a sign outside a church or funeral parlor saying, no mourning here, please. I, I heard a discussion with a, a, on a radio program some time ago, a good few months ago, about, a, again, there was a, an undertaker on it because the discussion was about death. And the undertaker was saying that the amount of requests, he said, that he was getting for what he called unconventional funerals. And he described unconventional funerals as funerals that just had nothing really to do, or very little to do with funerals as we know them. Often not a mention of God, a desire to wear white or to wear pink 
or for everyone to smile as they came in the door, or that kind of nonsense, you see. Because people don't want to mourn. Because mourning makes you somehow face up to something that's not good, something that's destructive, something that's ugly, and something that's corrosive. And surely it should go without saying that we as Christians just shouldn't buy into that in any shape or form. There is a time to mourn. And even as Christians, when we of all people have reason to rejoice at a funeral, it is right to mourn. We must mourn separation. We must mourn the effect of death, the separation it brings between body and soul, the separation it brings between brother and sister, between man and woman or husband and wife. We mourn it and we respect it. And we use countless ways to show that respect and we must keep these things. Death is to be respected. God means it to be taken like that. He doesn't mean it to be laughed at. He doesn't mean it to be ignored. And he doesn't want to to try to stop crying in the face of death and to pretend that it's not ugly. It all has its rightful place. Now, of course, the justification for this kind of behavior is that death is just a, a natural part of what they call the evolutionary process. So you just embrace it. Embrace it. If, you, if you can't really defeat it, which you can't, well, just embrace it and welcome it and accept it as part of the circle of life. Accept the fact that as your uh, bodily structure decays, it becomes a part of the grass that grows or the tree that grows, which brings forth fruit. And so let's rejoice and let's celebrate. That's, that's the view of life that underlies this new approach to death. Now, this single word, appointed, in verse 27, is the Bible's way, I suppose, of just cutting the feet off from all that. It immediately brings before us that that death is not just the result of a long, inevitable evolutionary process. Death is, in fact, something different altogether. This word, appointment, lifts death out of the world of nature and into the hands of God into the hands of God. It is to do with God, and he appoints it. That raises it to the level of the solemn, of the serious, the profound, the eternal. And it emphasizes two things right away. The first thing it emphasizes, I think, for us is the unnaturalness of death. Because after all, this God who appoints our death is the God of the living. And he is himself the living God. That's one of his names in the Bible, the living God. The God who lives in himself and is the source of all life. And I'll tell you what, he made you to live. And he made me to live. When man, male and female, stood first on this earth, they stood there almost godlike in a good and healthy way made in his image and likeness, in what's sometimes referred to by theologians as a psychosomatic unity, a unity of soul and body. We we are a person consisting of soul and body. Two things, two different substances welded together in a way that we could never separate. God can, but a way in which we could never separate. But, you know, the reason for that is that they were never meant to be separated. I know that there's a way of thinking about things, and you tend to say, well, God obviously made us to be separable like that. But no, that was not the intention. That's not the reason for which man was made. Man was made, male and female, to live forever in a psychosomatic unity. That's one of the reasons for the, the, the resurrection itself. The resurrection is the ultimate healing of that. The resurrection is the reconstitution of our body in union with our soul so that we live forever as God wants us to be. Say for for example that I were to die today and say that the resurrection day is another 3,000 years away. Well, if I go to glory, then my condition during that 3,000 year period is, is not fulfilled. It's not complete. John Calvin called the state of the soul in heaven there 
one of anticipatory blessedness, he called it. Anticipatory blessedness, because I'm waiting. Every saint in heaven is waiting for the resurrection of the body, because that's the way God made us. And that's why when death happens, nothing in the world can really convince us that it's natural. It is actually unnatural. I mentioned it before to you. I don't want to bore you with it, but I remember the first time that came home to myself when I saw the first dead body, who was my own uncle. And it just seemed I I had discarded more or less everything at that time. Discarded more or less everything. But it struck me so powerfully that whatever Whatever had gone from this man who lay in the bed in front of me, it was more than mere breath. It was more than could be explained simply by the random processes of atoms and chemicals and molecules. None of that could really explain what lay in front of me. It was the, the solemn impression for God, from God that this is unnatural. This is profoundly ugly. Ugly. And that it ought not be to be. And friends, that is exactly right. It is a non-natural thing. And I want you never to forget that. Never think of it as natural. Never think of it as inevitable in that sense, because it was not to have been. It ought not to have been. It is unnatural death. The second thing about it connected with that is that it is penal. It is a judgment from God. It is to do with sin. God said that to Adam from the beginning when he placed him in a covenant. And we were in that covenant with him. We were in his loins. I mean, not so God made the human race. He made it to live by descent, by generation, from one to another. And we're all bound up in Adam's loins. We receive the same nature as he has himself. And God said to him, in the day in which you sin, you shall surely die. You will die. It's... It's a result of rebellion. It's a judicial consequence of your rebellion, and that's what happened. The moment they sinned volitionally in their hearts, they died. Decay immediately started to work in the human body. Immediately. It took hundreds of years for our first parents to actually die. That's because the effect of sin is cumulative. You notice lifespan declines uh, rapidly, but... It takes its time, too, in another way. Decay comes in, and immediately the spiritual alienation is there. We've got the graphic pictures of that in the early chapters of Genesis. Adam and Eve try to hide themselves with fig leaves from God's presence. When they hear his voice, they know it doesn't work, and they go behind the trees of the garden. And ever since, your response and mine to God is just to run away, to try to hide from God, or to justify ourselves before God, to pretend he doesn't exist, however heavily the weight of his existence presses on our conscience and our heart and on our reason and understanding. We pretend he doesn't exist. We shut our eyes like a child thinking if we don't see him, he doesn't see us. And it's all foolishness. It's penal. Death is a judgment. I know that we have to modify that to some extent in connection with a Christian because... When a Christian dies, in a way, it's an anomaly. Because you wouldn't expect death to come into the Christian's life. There's a way in which you would think the Christian would just pass immediately into glory and the body would be transformed, but not so. God sees fit to leave death in the experience of the Christian. It's not a punishment, but it is a chastisement. But the thought of it coming is meant to have its own effect on the Christian as well as on the non-Christian. But at its core, at its heart, it's a penal thing. There's a word of judgment in it. And I suppose that's why you don't like it. It may be that you don't like to think of mourning and you don't like to think of death because the sense is in your conscience that it is unnatural and that it is penal. It is an affliction from God. And therefore, it is to be feared. Now, this word appointed does more than remind us that death's in God's hands. It certainly does that. It's appointed. If it's appointed, well, somebody's appointing. You can't have something appointed without an appointer, someone who makes the appointment, and that's in God's hands. The New Testament, the Old Testament, both parts of the Bible tells us that God sets the bounds of our habitation. He orders it. He sets the bounds of our life. He orders the day of our birth and the day of our death. 
We're told in the scriptures that they are alike appointed by God. That's it. The day you're born again is not a random event in a long, meaningless evolutionary process. It's an appointment. God knew and God foreordained that whatever day of the month it was in whatever year you would be born. And God has also appointed a certain day of a month of a certain year in which you will die. That appointment is made by God. We don't know it. Of course, we don't know it. Although I just made reference in the prayer there to the parable of the rich man who had the ground. And he had these big plans, you see, for what he was going to do with an unexpected yield from the crop. He was going to build bigger barns and so on. And then we're told that God said to him, thou fool. Now, I often wondered, should we press the expression, God said to him? I mean, I've I've very often thought of that in the past as though God in heaven were, as it were, seeing him upon the earth and speaking about him as though you were watching somebody doing something, as it were, on a TV monitor and shaking your head and saying, you fool, with the person not hearing you. But um, but I am wondering if we should really take the words quite literally and think that somehow that day this man heard God's voice, perhaps through somebody else or perhaps just in a vision or dream or whatever, heard God saying, fool, tonight your soul shall be required of you. If that's the case, it was amazing grace on God's part. It it was a word of warning. A word of warning. As I hope and pray this comes to yourself today. As a word of warning. To stop and to think about your plans for today or tomorrow or the next day. Plans that James says you should make very, very carefully. Very, very carefully. Saying, God willing in connection with all these plans. It's an appointment. He orders the day of our birth. He orders the day of our death. And we don't know it. We don't know the time. We don't know the place. Now, you may say, well, it would be better if we did. Well, I can understand why you think that. But it's God's wisdom that we don't. In unusual cases, he may reveal it. But normally, he does not. I'll tell you one person who knew it. Christ knew it. Christ knew it, but we don't. Uh, that's the difference between this appointment and the other appointments we make. When, when we have appointments in life, we normally make these appointments ourselves. Or even if somebody makes them for us, we have a hand in them. For example, you've got a, a checkup of some kind at the hospital or a procedure to go through, and they give you a date, and you get it in the post. And underneath it says, if you want to change this, phone this number. So you look at your diary and say, well, I can't make that day, but I could make this day. So you phone back, and together you make the appointment. And, of course, if the appointment is very important, um, you'll put an asterisk beside it, or you'll write it in red, or you'll underline it, because you don't want to forget that. I mean, whatever else is on that day, you've got to be there. You've got to be there. This is too big. And you can't afford to miss it. And the, the problem with this appointment, which we've all got, is that it's not in our diaries. It's not in our diaries because we don't know when it is. But it's in God's diary, and that's the point. That's the point. Some people have a problem like I have, that we forget things that we don't write down. <clears throat> Sometimes even when you write it, you, you can forget it. You can forget to be in a place and you look back and it was written in your diary, but you forgot to look. God doesn't forget this appointment. You can miss an appointment. You can be late. You can be early. But God makes sure that you're going to be there for this appointment. Let's say your death is on the 12th of January, 2015. Let's say it's 1120 well, you're not going to be early. You're not going to be late. The, the wheels of God's providence will make sure that you will be absolutely where he said you would be at that time. Saying what you are saying or about to say what you are about to say when you pass away. It's written. It's written. You won't be early. You won't be late. You will be there. 
Neither, of course, can you reschedule it. How can you reschedule an appointment that you don't even know? You would like maybe to say, oh, well, I would love it if I was going to die in 78 years' time, peacefully on my bed, and, and make that arrangement with God. Well, that can't happen. In fact, the tragedy of this is that you're actually double-booked. You're double-booked because it's more than likely that you'll have something else on at the time and the place when God says dead. You've got something else in your diary there. You've got the dentist at 2 p.m. and God says dead. You've got a gym appointment at half past six and God says dead. You're meeting with friends or you're going on a big family holiday and God says, no, you're not. You're dead. It's a double booking. And whenever there's a double booking, it's the most important party that gets the precedence. I remember once myself when I was a student, double booking. And uh, it was very difficult. But I was working for somebody at the time and the person said, well, you'll be what I said, said to you. That's what I had to do. The person I was working for. So it doesn't matter what we want to do or that day or the other. It's our master who is in heaven. Oh, you'll be there. You'll be there. And you'll breathe your last. And then you will find yourself in the presence of God. Now, strangely, the Bible here says in verse 27 that it is appointed for men to die once. Why does it say once? What possible emphasis can be gained by using the word once? Is, would it not be enough to, for the inspired writer to say that it is appointed for men to die? Well, in a way, yes. But you know, the word once reminds us of something. It reminds us that we live once. We die once because we live once. We've only got one life to live. There are several forms of theology that teach a kind of second chance, that you get a second opportunity. Some religions are built around it, the idea of coming back and somehow doing something again. But, but the Bible just doesn't allow for that. One time of probation and one life to live. Sometimes people look back on raising their children and they say, well, I wish I could do that again. And they're conscious they can't. They can't. But how many people say it about life? I, I, I wish I could live that again. Of course, there are others who say, well, that was hard and I wouldn't want to. But, but that's really what they mean, too, when they say, I wish I could live it again. I wish I, could I wish I would avoid making the hash of it that I did first time around. Well, I'll tell you what, friends, we're, we're all wiser after the event. In everything in life, we're usually wiser after the event. But the fact is that if you're Christless, by and large, you wouldn't make any better a, a, a job of it second time around. And in any case, you aren't going to get it. It's not there. We have one set of chances, one set of opportunities. These chances and opportunities may come again and again in the lifespan, but the span's all you've got. The 60, 70, 80 years, or 15 years, for all you know, is all you've got. And when you die, you die once because you live only once. There's no second opportunity. Uh, that's it. You live once and you die once. And after that, he says, the judgment. The judgment. There is a way, of course, in which we are all judged at the moment we die. We know that. Um, if you're a believer in Christ, your soul will go to glory immediately. That's the Bible's teaching. There's no doubt about that. It doesn't go into a state of sleep. It doesn't go into some kind of state of suspended animation. It goes straight to be with the Lord. Today you shall be with me in paradise, Christ says. He doesn't say to him today, later on you'll be fast asleep and you won't have a clue where you are. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. The Apostle Paul himself, of course, said that for me, he says, to die, that's better, he says, because it is to be with Christ, to be with Christ. If you die as an unbeliever, you are immediately going to your punishment, to the place of ruin and desolation that is called hell. But there, 
It's preparatory. I mean, God knows what we deserve, and there's a sense in which he instantly judges us, but we all await the day of judgment there. The day of judgment is a different thing. It is a day when people are summoned from heaven, they are summoned from hell, they are summoned from the earth. Bodies are summoned from the graves and all gather before the public judgment seat of God for a final public statement of who is righteous and who is unrighteous. It's a, it's a declaration, a universal declaration of truth and righteousness from God. So that day may be 10,000 years away, 20,000 years away. I have no idea. But my death links me immediately to that judgment seat. Because death is like God's hand from the judgment seat 20,000 years away. Let's say, for the sake of, for the sake of it, let's say 20,000 years away. It's God's hand reaching down into time and just bringing me up there, as it were, as though the intervening period didn't matter. As the scripture says, as the tree falls, so it shall lie. As death finds me, so I shall be. I can't expect to die today, I mean, 20,000 years ago, to appear as a different person before the judgment seat of Christ. I am who I am then. That, that's, that's the solemnity of this life. That's the profundity of it, that as death finds you, so you shall be. Do you think of it? Do you think of it often enough? As death finds you, so you shall be. So we have an appearance to make in verse 27. After this, after our death, the judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, it's not long. In a way, I don't want to say too much about this because it's not long since we looked at it from Matthew 25. In Matthew 25, Christ himself gave the history of his own appearing a second time. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, he says, with the holy angels. Then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory, and the nations, he said, shall be gathered before him. Significantly, he takes his place on the judgment seat. It is the judgment seat of Christ. And as you all know very well, and as you've heard preached very often, there are only two gatherings in front of him. The angels have already made the separation. The angels escort everyone to their own several destinies. There are those on the right and those on the left. And I suppose one look at themselves and one look at everyone else indicates immediately who you are and to whom you belong. Two groups. Now, there's a way in which we would look at life and its complexity and we'd say, well, surely there's more than two groups. Surely there's a group here who are pretty good and not that bad. Surely there's a group over there that are absolutely awful. Surely there's a group here that are utterly wonderful. In all the myriad complexities of human life and human existence, are there not thousands of groups receiving different rewards and judgments? And the Bible says, no, two, two. Now, the rest of Christ's parables make very plain that within these two groups there are gradations. There are differences between us in our heavenly glorious existence. There are also differences in hell itself. Our Lord speaks of those who will be beaten with many stripes, as well as those who will be beaten with lesser stripes. But in the final analysis, there are two groups. And you'll notice that to one it is said, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So in whatever state you find yourself in that kingdom, whatever status or rank you occupy, it's one of blessedness, in the joy of the Lord, in the eternal happiness of the saints. And if you find someone higher than you, and I'll find countless higher than me, I will thank God that they're higher, and I will rejoice in the fact that they're higher because I love them as they love me. And to the other group, whatever the distinctions Whatever the divisions, whatever the number of the stripes that are laid upon you, it is a singular judgment. Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and for his angels. And the least, the least state in that, it's no pleasant state. Is that not obvious? There is no such thing 
as having a good time in any way in hell. There is not. There are two groups in the judgment seat of God. And you today belong to one of them. And if that hand of God from the judgment seat were to pluck you out of this seat, now in death you would find yourself fit for one of these groups and one of these destinies. Indeed, you would go there preparatively until the time came for the final judgment of God. It's, it's as serious as that. I sometimes myself have to pause and to gasp and to think and to comprehend that all that has to do with my existence here now. I can be so close to you and I can be so like you. And we can sit together with many of the same troubles and the same griefs and the same challenges in life and the same children to raise, the same schools to go to, the same places of entertainment, perhaps. But there's such a chasm, such a chasm between what's in the heart of the believer and what's in the heart of the unbeliever, between the one who knows the Lord and who loves him and the one who does not know him and does not love him. It's almost inconceivable that such a difference should consist where things look so alike. But lo and behold, so it is. So it is. As Malachi says in chapter 3, you shall see in that day the difference between the just and the unjust, between the one who fears the Lord and the one who fears him not. You shall see in that day. In that day. Sometimes we get a glimpse of it here, but it will be very plain in that day. There's a sacred treasure in some hearts in here today, friends. There's a sacred treasure. The love of God. The love of God. In other hearts, there is only darkness and alienation. And the difference will just become more and more plain in the endless ages of eternity. As, as these two things ripen out to their fullest extent, so the differences will appear. Now, interestingly, Paul says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We must all appear there. That word appear doesn't just mean that we must be seen there. If I was to say to you that I was going to appear in such and such a place in such a time, you would just say, well, that just means I'm, you're going to see me there. You're going to see me there. But it's a particular word in the Greek language which means more than just to be seen. It, it means, to, it means to, to expose. That's really what it means. It means to expose. We must all be exposed before the judgment seat of Christ. The idea is that it's all going to be revealed. There's an expression that people use sometimes about certain people, you know, like people who are easy to read. They wear their heart on their sleeve, you know, they, they, their emotions are there very much in the open. <clears throat> well, on that day, you wear your heart on your sleeve. The inside comes out. That's what Paul says. The idea isn't so much that everything you've said and everything you've done will, will, will be brought out into the public. That, that's, I'm not saying that won't happen. I'm just saying it's not particularly the idea. The idea is that, that the real truth about you and me just comes to be plain. It, it would be a digression, really, to ask whether everything we've ever thought and said and done will, will be replayed in front of everybody else. Just as it were in a moment of time, our minds will be different then. There will be an ability to comprehend things that happen very, very quickly. Maybe, and all the fears I have about that happening, um, I've traced back to pride, very simply to pride. I suppose I'll see my sins myself very differently that day as doubtless everybody else will. If it's all, if the replay of my life, however ugly it is, is somehow to the glory of God, so be it. I'll be able to look at it, no doubt, as God looks at it. I'll be able to thank God for the, for the blanket of covering that was spread over it. I, I just leave that to himself. I honestly don't worry about it. But the main fact being taught here is that the truth is out. The truth is out. In other words, God will show, perhaps he'll take the best things in your life if you're not a Christian, and he'll show how they were fatally flawed. Fatally flawed. 
He, he'll take the best thoughts you had, the best intentions and everything, and he'll show how, how he was not in any of it. He, he'll show how there was an anti-godness there, how there was a rebellion underlying it, how somehow that stubborn streak of selfishness was just very much in it. And on the other hand, he'll take a poor Christian man or woman and show that underneath everything there was a love to God. There was an embrace of Christ by faith, that 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 was the dominating impetus behind that life. And he'll show it. He'll show it. He'll go deep down into the realm of motive, where only God himself operates, where only God himself knows. He'll go deep down into the realm of motive, and he'll take it all out. He says, look, look there, look there, there. That's why that is my child. In spite of that awful blot in their life, that's why that is my child. And there, that is why that is not. It'll be seen. We will all be made manifest. Paul says it's the day in which the secrets of men's hearts will be revealed. And it's the same thought there. It's not so much the idea that every every little, little secret thing is out. That's not the idea. The secret things of men's heart, again, is who you are and what makes you tick. It comes out into the open. Into the open. And like our physical death, that judgment seat just comes once. Just as it's appointed for men to die once and after this, the solitary single judgment. Why? And I'm finishing with this. Well, again, because we only have one life to live and one death to die. Why should there be any more judgments? It's the supreme judge and ruler of the universe who sits on the throne anyway. He has all knowledge. He's never going to suspend the trial and say, well, hold on a minute, there's some information that we need that's not to hand, that's not going to happen. He's the one whom Daniel describes as having his hair white as wool because he is supremely wise. The, the gray hair and the aged and the wisdom go together in Scripture. He has, all wisdom. he has all knowledge to know all the facts of every case and all wisdom to weigh all these facts accurately. Who, who's going who's gonna to go behind that? Who's going to go behind that? There's no lack of evidence when your life is before God's judgment seat. There's no Scottish verdict of not proven at the judgment seat of Christ. That's just not there. There's no court of appeal. Who's going to sit in that? There's no suspended sentence either. It's done, and it's finished. We're told that the result of this is that the righteous go away into everlasting life and those who are not into everlasting punishment, which the Scripture, incidentally, does call the second death. I know here that it says that we die once, but the reference there is to a physical life. We just die once, and we have no second chance. But he says what happens at that place, he says, is called the second death. When the judgment is sealed and when it is final, it's the second death because it is irrevocable and it is unchangeable. So there is a reason to be afraid of death. There is a reason. Uh, Someone said to me once, and it stuck with me, and I'm sure I've mentioned it before, someone said to me, I'm not really afraid of death, I'm just afraid of the unknown. And they explain that in an evolutionary way, we're always afraid of the unknown, scares us. But I want you to rethink that completely and utterly, and I want you to start wondering if perhaps you're afraid of the known, or you're afraid of the suspected. That you suspect deep down, because you do know, Romans 1 teaches, you know, you suspect suspect deep down that death is not the end of everything. You suspect deep down that all we are, the bundles of our lives, from the Hitlers down to the ordinary common people of God, that we will all be taken and that there's a consequence for our lives, a consequence for what you did. You somehow have to give account. It would be strange if you didn't. I somehow think it's a terribly despairing thing if all the gross evil in the world just somehow happens, and that's that. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. The voice of God is very real in your conscience. 
And the one thing this does surely is it calls us to preparation. It calls us to preparation. Uh, when you have an announcement, an appointment, sorry, that's written in red in your diary or it's underlined or there's an asterisk or something, well, you're going to, perhaps the day before you're going to get ready for that. You're going to get ready for that. But if you've got an appointment this big that is effectively written in every single day of your diary, you've got to get ready for that. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man comes. And one way in which you get ready is just like James said, say God willing for everything. You're making a plan for tomorrow, a big plan, big plan for your business, big plan for your family, big plan for your life. Say God willing, God willing, God willing. Because your life is a vapor that appears for a moment. And of course you be ready by being reconciled to God. John Wesley once famously was asked, what would you do if you knew God was coming tomorrow? And he took out his diary and he looked at his diary and said, I would do exactly he says, what I'm going to do because I'm not ashamed of any of it. I, I, I take care every day that what I do, I, ca I can be glad if I am found by the Lord doing it. There's a sense in which I put my amen to that, but there's another sense in which I would agree with the other man who said I, I would make sure I would spend time in prayer in preparation. The fact is that you need to be put right with God, and that's where, that's where it becomes so precious. In verse 28, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to those who wait for him, he'll appear the second time for salvation. We'll see what that means tonight. Let us pray. Our gracious and merciful God, how solemn an event, death. The world tells us that death and taxes are inevitable. But of these two, death is truly what is certain, and death is more fearful. Help us then to reckon with the one great inevitability of life. Help us to look at, to look at it and to look at Christ, the antidote and the bringer of life. Oh, how we thank you today that there is such a thing as a gospel that there is such a thing as good news to eradicate death from our lives. And we pray that through Christ, O Lord, and faith in him, we might find it. Amen.